As many of you know, the ministries of, one of the ministries of the Western Pennsylvania District is the Hogar Emanuel Children's Home in Honduras. And since 1972, hundreds of children who are homeless from the age of infancy to 18 years of age are able to live in a loving, Christian, family-type atmosphere. For the home to continue to offer this care, they depend on our prayers and our donations. Recently, they have suffered some setbacks with the passing of their office administrator from COVID, flooding from the last hurricane, and needing to replace a refrigerator and freezer that were just worn out. We felt that maybe we could help a little bit with the Blue Bear Project. You probably remember seeing these around the church before. We are placing these little blue bears around the church, and if you have some loose change, please drop it in, and it'll help the children at Hogar Emanuel Children's Home. One thing about down where these children are at, they do raise their own vegetables. I believe they do chickens and are able to sell their eggs. So they do some things to help support themselves, which is really great in this day and age that they have a, you know, some source of income and some things that they can learn as a tra help with a trade. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord, it is so good to be in your house this morning. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for praying for us and being there for us. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody today? Huh? Okay, okay. I just didn't hear. I want to read some scripture from the book of John, the 17th chapter, verses 6 through 19. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words that you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, for, but for those who... You have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, the truth, your word is truth. As I sent them into the world, I have sent them, into, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they may be truly sanctified. This passage relates Jesus' last major prayer before he, his arrest and crucifixion, the last time he prayed publicly. Our lesson from John's Gospel this morning is often referred to as the, quote, real Lord's Prayer. It's the one in which he prayed for his, his friends, the apostles. Jesus knew that his ministry and his life were both coming to an end. He had already submitted himself to the Father's will. He knew that his arrest and trial and very public, very humiliating, very violent death would throw his apostles into turmoil. 
Put yourself in their place. Imagine seeing Jesus' arrest and torture and death through their eyes. Wouldn't you be overwhelmed with grief, fear? You'd have questions. You'd have doubts. I know I would have been. I mean, I would have, I would have freaked out. I'd have been like Peter. I'd have went and hid someplace. Now, at this point, you see, Jesus could have done a miracle. He could have saved his own life. He could have continued his ministry on earth. He could have appeared to his apostles with a host of angels around him, protecting him. He could have supernaturally took his apostles with him to heaven so that they wouldn't have to suffer in any way because of their faith in him. Jesus could have done all that. It was all within his power. But they weren't, it wasn't God's will for him or his followers. They weren't what God sent him to earth to accomplish. Jesus gives us a perfect example of how to align our choices with God's will. Even if God's will is scary and difficult to understand. That's one of the primary purposes of prayer, to develop a loving, trusting relationship uh, <clears throat> between us and God so that we naturally align ourselves with God's will. And so Jesus in his last hours on this earth did what he always done throughout his ministry. He took his concerns to his father in prayer. Jesus prayed for others in that prayer. He prayed for his disciples and he prayed for all those people he had never met. People who hadn't even been born yet. Generations of people who would come to believe in him as their Lord and Savior. In other words, in his last hours on earth, Jesus prayed for you and me. Isn't that incredible? I don't know if any of you have read about Navy SEALs, but their training is very intense. One te technique that they practice regularly is how to perform underwater attacks against enemy ships. And it's a grueling and ri risky operation. Two SEAL divers are dropped off at night at least two miles from an enemy harbor. With only a depth gauge and a compass, these two divers have to swim in the dark underwater to reach the ship, the enemy ship. But this isn't the hardest part of the, the mission. The hardest part is when the divers have to dive below the ship to the very center of its hull, underneath this ship, underneath this huge steel ship. There's no light whatsoever. It is total black. The divers must complete the rest of the mission in total darkness. And it's only because they prepare so thoroughly beforehand that they can be able to operate with total skill and composure in the dark. So, <clears throat> if you want to change the world, you see, you must be able to do your very best in your darkest moment. And our scripture today shows Jesus at his very best in his darkest moment. He was calm, confident in his father's love and his father's plan for him. In fact, he was so confident that he barely felt a, a need to pray for himself. Instead, he prayed for his apostles who would be left behind to do the work. He knew they were weak. He knew they were scared and they were unprepared, just as you and I would be weak and scared and unprepared in similar circumstances. And that's exactly why prayer is the first and best cure for dealing with our own dark moments. 
One sure benefit of faithful prayer is that nothing can happen to you that you can't make use of. Nothing. Think about that for a minute. When you maintain regular faithful communication with God, God will reveal to you wisdom that means nothing can happen to you that you can't make use of. Even suffering and sorrow and fear and doubts, God's wisdom and perspective will allow you to make use of your worst moments, just as Jesus did. So imagine that you are one of Jesus' friends, the disciples. In their presence, Jesus prayed, thanking God for them and praying for their well-being. Jesus' prayer was startling to them. It was breathtaking to them. Having learned so much from Jesus as they traveled with him for the better part of three years, maybe what stuck in their minds, the disciples, was how he prayed. They saw him pray all the time. He would go off by himself, but he prayed earnestly. At one point, the disciples asked them to teach him, to, to teach them how he prayed. And that's when Jesus taught them the model prayer that we know as the Lord's Prayer. But in this day, on that time, before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed for his friends. It's always reassuring when you are going through a difficult time in your life to know that someone else is praying for you. We sometimes forget how powerful a simple prayer can be. Do you pray for your friends? Jesus did. And you know what? In the same way that Jesus prayed for his apostles, he prays for us. In times of confusion, when we are unsure of what to do next, it's a great comfort, you see, to know that Jesus is praying for us. But the question is, how did he pray? How did he pray? What did he ask for? Jesus prayed that God would help his friends remain strong. That's always a very appropriate prayer, the prayer for strength. Dr. E. Stanley Jones once told about two men praying. One man prayed, Lord, please help me to hold on. The other man prayed, Lord, please help me to let go. Have you ever prayed either one of those prayers? I think we can all relate to them. Each one requires a different kind of strength. There are two types of strength. There's the strength of the wind that sways the mighty oak tree. And then there's the strength of the oak tree that withstands the power of the wind. There's the strength of the locomotive that pulls the heavy train across the bridge. But then there's the strength of the bridge that holds up the weight of the train. One is an active strength. The other is a passive strength. One is a power to keep going, and the other is the power to keep still. One is the strength that we overcome, the other is the strength to endure. Jesus' prayer is a great reminder to us that God never intended for us to suffer and struggle through life under our own strength. He did not. We have limited strength. We have limited wisdom and limited perspective. Our circumstances sometimes looks more powerful than God's love for us. Through prayer, God wants to restore our strength, deepen our wisdom, and elevate our perspective through prayer. Now, Jesus knew the cost of being one of his followers in those early days. He knew that it would be high. He knew there would be times when his disciples' lives would be in danger. He knew there would be times when they would be tempted to run. 
Notice that Jesus didn't pray that they would be released from their problems. Instead, he prayed for them to be strong. Strong enough to withstand the challenges that lay ahead. Jesus didn't pray for escape. He prayed for victory. He prayed, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. In 1943, at the start of the Allied invasion of Normandy in World War II, a private wrote a friend of his, and he said, I don't want you to pray for my safety, because, and I quote, safety isn't the ultimate goal. The goal, he said, was true exemplary conduct. That's the goal. Now, apply that thought to your own life as followers of Jesus. Safety isn't the ultimate goal. True exemplary conduct is. And as this private said, what is important is that whatever happens, I will absolutely do nothing that will shame my character or my God. Think about it. I will do nothing to shame my character or my God. That sounds very much like Jesus' prayer for his friends, doesn't it? He could have taken his apostles to eternal life with him. He could have taken away their struggles and their suffering, but he didn't. Because their struggles and suffering were absolutely necessary for the power of God to work through them. They were an essential test of faith that convinced Jesus' followers of faithfulness and truth and the power of God. They were essential. It was their faithful witness in their sufferings and struggles that built the church of Jesus Christ. One prayer that God always answers is the prayer for strength to endure. Always answers that prayer. Jesus prayed for the apostles so that they would find strength during their times of suffering. That was a prayer that was answered time and time again in their life. It's a prayer that some of us have prayed as well. I know you have. I have. God is faithful. He will not forget us in our time of need. Jesus prayed for his friends and he prayed that they would be strong. He also prayed that they would be united together. He prayed, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. This is such an important message to us and for us. We're not simply a collection of individuals. We're the body of Christ. It's so important that we in the church pull together, that we are united. Too many things can disrupt the unity of the church. You know, people get upset with the decisions of the board. Happens to Betsy. Yet they won't let their name be... No, I won't go. Or people get upset with the pastor. <laughs> that never happens. Jesus knew that it is not easy to maintain unity among talented and yet sometimes cantankerous people. <laughs> you know. He also knew that we can never accomplish the things that he has called us to accomplish if we don't pull together. If we don't come together as one, unity doesn't come easy. It requires humility and a shared vision. And most of all, unity requires prayer. When we align our will with the will of God and when we align our character with Jesus' character, then and only then will we be operate in a spirit of unity and we can accomplish the work that Jesus told us to do and 
wants us to do on earth if we can just learn to work together. Jesus is praying for us. He's asking God two things in our behalf. First of all, he's asking that we be strong. And I don't know about you, but that's a prayer that I need daily. I need it daily. And secondly, he's praying that we be united. That one, that's one prayer we could actually help answer ourselves. We could start praying for our friends. We could pray for our church. Finally, we could pray for ourselves that we will truly be strong and that we will always, always love one another. That's a prayer that aligns with God's will and is this in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will be faithful to answer that prayer until the day that we meet him face to face. Amen? Amen. 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 Isn't it a comfort to know that Jesus walks with us and talks with us? He's there every day. He's right beside you right now. He's right there. You feel, the, feel that warm feeling right now. I know you do. But that feeling's got to go with us as we leave this place. We've got to take him with us. We can't leave him here. He wants to go with us, to be with us in our life, in our witness. Lord, we just ask that you would be with us in our witness. We know that you'll be with us every step of the way. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your love that you give to us constantly every day. And we just thank you so much. Until we meet again, amen. <laughs>